Shalom Chavim. It's nice to get a chance to speak with you again. And today I have with me uh, my wife, and we're going to actually talk to you about biblical equality. Uh, I know that's a subject that is strange to many people, and I'm going to take you back a little bit and rehearse with you, those of you that are familiar with the teachings I do on the redemption of Israel, because in the redemption of Israel, there's a lot of things that I speak about that show what happened in the garden, what happened in the fall, and what redemption brings to us. And so I want to share those things with you again, especially this may be the first time someone's ever heard this. Um, we may find uh, that you want to share this video with people that you've not shared it with in the past because of the subject itself. And uh, my wife has, uh, has done a lot of extensive research in the Greek language, and so she's going to be sharing the insights that God has given her. And uh, we'll start off on a platform here going back to Genesis. So if you have your Bible, uh, turn with us into the book of Genesis. That's where we'll begin at. And um, I'd like to start off with you here in Genesis chapter 1. And let's just look from verse 26 uh, down a couple of verses here. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. They shall rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and over the animal the whole earth and every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Now, it's interesting uh, to note here, even in the Hebrew language, if you look at it, uh, everything is in the plural there. You know how I've mentioned to you in the past before, when we look at the word Elohim being the way we say God in Hebrew, but it's a plural form for his name. And I've showed you how that when you look at the first sentence in the Bible, Be'roshit bara Elohim et HaShemayim et Ha'aretz, that says, at the first, God created the heavens and the earth. But the verb is singular. The word created um, is, is singular in that, in that particular case, showing that it's only one God. It's not two gods. And, but when we have here where, we, where God is saying that in God he blessed them, and, and he said to them, uh, God says to them that they will rule over the fish, uh, uh, excuse me, uh, let me just get where the verse is there, uh, over, he should, that they will rule over the fish of the sea and of the bird of the sky and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Every part of the rulership is done in the plural, showing that they're co-equal in, in, in God's creation. And I think that's important to note. Uh, another thing just to point out to you, and those of you that watch the videos know this, God doesn't call Adam, Adam in the beginning. He calls him Ish, which is, from, uh, is spelled in, in Hebrew, Aleph Yod Shin. And in woman, when she's first brought into being, uh, after he, she is taken from uh, man, she's called Isha. Now, the rabbinical scholars have noted that the names there are the two letters from, if you take the, the Yod out of the middle of the name of Ish, it's Aleph Yod Shin. Take the Yod out, let's just move it up. Then you have Aish, which is fire. The Yod being the first letter in the divine name of God, Yah, uh, for, 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 the, for Yah or Yahweh. And with Isha, it's Aleph Shin He. And the last letter in her name, if you move it up, now you have Yod, yod He. So you have the divine name for God right there. But again, the Aish, the fire. And it proves without a doubt that they did have the Holy Spirit when they were first brought into brought onto the earth here. Um, but again, we're just I want to set a little platform here because in redemption, what Moshiach was going to do is to restore back what was lost. So first off, I want you to see that they had the Holy Spirit, both of them did. Uh, and we're going to go a little deeper into that real quick and just kind of highlighting this because many of you can watch the videos and see it in the past what I've said on this. Um, if As we move down into chapter 2, uh, we get to a place where God is, uh, um, and let me just, I'm trying to find that verse there where he says it's not good for man to dwell alone. Um, and is that? I, th I think it's important that we understand why God says it was not good for the man to be alone. 
Um, but as I, as I get into that, though, uh, when in verse 7, And Hashem God formed the man of the dust from the ground, and he blew into his nostrils the soul of life, and man became a living being. It's interesting, especially if you read this from the Hebrew language. We have to remember in the garden, there were two trees in particular that were a little different than all the other trees in the garden. And that was the tree of life, Es Chaim, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And I can believe that we, I can prove it scripturally that Yeshua was indeed the tree of life, the Es Chaim. And there's many things we'll go into later, later as me and my wife speak with you on these subjects. Uh, that will help you to understand how we know that he was the Eitz Chaim. But uh, we see that God, when he forms the man from the dust of the ground, he breathes into his nostrils the breath of life. In Hebrew, it's Nishmat Chaim. Nishmat Chaim. Chaim is the fruit from the tree of life. So, and what is Chaim? Now, a lot of times we just translate that as life, but in this case here, it's Yahweh's life. It's Yahweh, however you want to say the divine name there. It is his own life being breathed into, into this one man, Adam, and it's breathed into, the, into him in a plural form. Uh, that's why we have the, the Yod Mim at the end of the uh, name there, uh, Chaim. But then God says a strange thing, Ve'ahi Adam Nefesh Chaya. Then uh, then it was for the man, for his soul, which was Chaya, which was the life of God. Now it's in the singular, because why? He's speaking specifically concerning Adam. Uh, and, and no doubt this proves to us that if they had the very life of Yahweh in there, then it was certainly the Holy Spirit, what we would call the Holy Spirit today, was living inside of them. And that was the, the Ruach HaKadosh was the fruit. It was God's life that was the tree of life could, was able to bear out and was to give out. So therefore, the way that fruit was partaken was by breath. God breathed into their nostrils this breath of life. And so as we go on, though, we find, though, that, that, that we, the fall takes place in the garden. Uh, and, and, and also, when I say this, let me just mention too quickly, though. Um, oh, before, before, let me, before we get into the fall, though, let's just real quick, let's take a look there. Um, He's a living soul, but then what happens? We see that God says, and where where was that verse at there? Where, it was uh, chapter 2, verse 18. Verse 18. Hashem, God said, It is not good that a man be alone. I will make him a helper corresponding to him. There is so much that can be said in this sentence alone. And one thing that I've never shared with you guys before that I feel very passionate about here is that for God to say that it's not good for the man to be alone, I believe that Adam, with his wife inside of him, I believe it's a type of Christ right here. You know, I really believe that that's what we're seeing. It was a type of Christ, God knowing what he knew that there was going to be a fall. And he knew as he had made himself material. He had made himself tangible in the dimension we live in when God himself actually, well, I'm sweating like crazy with all these lights in here, uh, but when God made himself tangible, when he says, in the, like John says, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the first word we find in the beginning, or in the book of Genesis, Be'oshit, is when he says, Ve'yomer Elohim Yahi Or. And God said, not let there be, it's eternity becoming expressed in the dimension in which we're living in. And that was God bringing himself into our dimension so he could have fellowship with us. And then we see him as the tree of life. And we, if, we, if you just think about it, when, when Yeshua was on earth, just before he departed this earth, he did something very strange. He breathed on his apostles and he said, receive ye the Holy Spirit. I mean, that is... That should tell us right there who he was. Because that's what he did with Adam. He breathed on him. Nishma Chaim. He breathed in his nostrils the breath of life. Of course, it was just a clay figure there. But really and truly, that's all we are. Our clay figures without the Spirit of God inside of us. And so, here it was. 
Yeshua, down through the ages, he saw Israel, he loved Israel, he loved his creation, he knew it was going to fall, but all the life, all of our, all of our, um, the spirit of God that was supposed to be imparted into us, he had trapped within his own bosom. And yet, the, 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 the law of God that he says, replenish and multiply the earth, never stopped. Even though the fall came, they never stopped bringing forth children, but yet, they could not bring forth children filled with the Spirit of God. So death had set in. And in Christ, all those people that were dying, that eternal life was still inside of him. And it moved him to such great compassion till he come to this earth and was willing to die in order to bring forth his bride, to redeem his bride in this case here. And I think with Adam... We are seeing, we take such so lightly perhaps what God is saying here when he said it's not good for the man to be alone. I believe that Adam was actually feeling a little portion of what Christ felt down through the ages. He had his wife inside of him and he wanted so bad for that fellowship to be able to, to he longed for her. And really and truly, the word helper here, uh, Ezra Kanegiro, is... And I want my wife to speak on this in just a second as well before we really get into things there. It is a rescuer. You know, and God, is, with Eve is used one time. Every other time in the Bible we see it, we always see it with God with Israel, rescuing Israel out of trouble. But this is exactly what Eve come to do, or else he would have died. If you would. This is my wife, Yana Satova Benin. Everybody, I'm sure you'll enjoy her there. If you, can, if you would, honey, uh, can you share with uh, the people here? And we'll, we'll continue. Uh, we'll get into the rest of the redemption of this a little bit here. But if you can, because uh, I know you know a lot about from your own studies of Greek uh, and, and things like that. And even in the Hebrew where you've done some extensive study and research there. I'd like for you maybe just to start right there on Ezra. Oh, okay. Well, you are better in Hebrew than I am. I'm certainly asking you questions about Hebrew. I always, I actually did a lot of research on Greek and Paul, Paul letters, and what did Paul really say about women, because that was very important for me as a woman to really know the truth, because as you know, in the mainstream churches, they are teaching patriarchal order. They are teaching that man is authority or a spiritual leader of a woman. And um, a lot of times listening to these kind of speeches, I kind of felt humiliated because I felt like God is calling me one-on-one -on -one to Him. However, I was meant to, by all these theologians and leaders, uh, I, I was told that I can't speak on my own only through my husband. Basically, they're teaching that the role of a woman is to obey the leadership of her husband and the way you get to God as a woman is through your husband. So God communicates to a man and then man communicates to a woman. But I saw some discrepancies because even in the Old Testament I have noticed that God did use women for his service and every yes. time he wanted to communicate something to a woman he went right directly to her. One example is Mary right exactly when gabriel came to mary and said you're going to have a baby and you will name him jesus gabriel came to mary alone he didn't come to joseph he didn't come to her father and that was a patriarchal society where women had no rights and unless if they were not married they were under leadership or headship of their father and when they were married they were under headship of their husbands but God had communicated this truth with her alone. It was between her and God. Amen. And she was the main character. Basically, her husband Joseph was informed much later and only out of necessity because he wanted to divorce her. And I also noticed that uh, mainstream theologians forget to mention leaders, women leaders in Israel such as Miriam who was a very important leader. Sadly, her and Aaron uh, kind of backslid, and Moses had to pray them out of their leprosy. However, she was a leader chosen by God. 
and also Deborah, of course, she's almost never mentioned as a leader of Israel. That's exactly right. And exactly right. it is, uh, you can read it in Book of Judges, you can read about her. She was a leader of Israel and she made all the decisions and judging of entire Israel, men and women. And she was a married woman, yet her husband is not even mentioned he had anything to do with it. And she was chosen by God himself. And if God has instituted patriarchy, as they are actually teaching, he will never go against his own laws and choose a woman. However, this woman, Deborah, did take Israel out of a horrible situation of idolatry. And she brought Israel to the right standing in front of God. And she was a judge or a leader as a president today for right. 40 years, equaling like, for example, um, Samuel was. Well, you know, <clears throat> that brings out a good point, especially when we're looking at the redemption of Israel. Uh, and I think what, what you're saying right here, it would be a good point to look at what, you know, to, to continue to look at the fall here, because one, as I said, you know, we saw he was, that she is a, a helper corresponding to him or a rescuer. Um, and you know, it's funny, I, I got a comment today on one of the YouTube videos that I did where someone was criticizing me for saying that Melchizedek, Melchizedek is actually God himself, uh, manifesting in, in flesh form. And they were citing the tradition of the, of the, of the Jewish writings and stuff like that. And, and I do look at a lot of the, the writings that we have uh, amongst the, uh, the sages uh, and, and the writers, etc. But I, when I wrote that person back, I mentioned to them, I said, you have to remember, this is what got our people in the trouble we got into in the begin with, is just believing every single word that God's spoken by the sages. Um, and, and yet, uh, one rabbi recently, uh, Rabbi Barrett, we were debating a little bit about this subject, and he said, Steve, some of the things that you say, he said, they're totally against what the Talmud teaches. I said, but, I said, my brother, you have to remember, even the rabbinical scholars from the Talmud, the Midrash, uh, Rashi, Ibn Ezra, all of these guys, they debated one another as well. I said, and their words are not the prophets, nor the writings, nor the Torah uh, that we know as the infallible word of God. So therefore, we have a right to dispute what they write as well. And they're men just as we were men, or sisters in this case. Uh, I mean, I even think about the, the one uh, particular, before we get right back to this, it just comes to my mind, though, uh, when Moses, when, he, when, when there was these sisters that came to him, and they were complaining because there was no one, no son in their father's uh, heritage to be able to, uh, to take his inheritance. And so Moses goes before God, and inquires, what do I do? And God commands Moses to give the daughters the inheritance of their father, which was totally contrary to patriarchal society. Now, let's see though why patriarchal society got here in the first place. And we find that in the fall itself. Now, I know I'm kind of getting away from some of the points that I want to make out here. Um, uh, but yeah, let me, let me just touch this real quick because we need to understand this as well. If you look in Genesis chapter 2, verse 21, And so God, Hashem, cast a deep sleep upon the man, and he slept. Uh, and as I said just a few moments ago, I believe that Adam got to a place to where it was almost like death for him. He, had, he, he didn't necessarily probably know what was going on, but he needed his helpmate, and God sent her, her to rescue him because God saw that it was not good that a man was to be alone. I mean, he was seeing the anguish that he was going through, being alone the way he was. So he puts him into a deep sleep, and he took one of his sides, and he filled in the flesh in its place. Now, that's very accurately translated. Most people think that God took a rib from Adam and made, and made his wife. Nowhere in the Hebrew language does it ever say that he took a rib. Well, here in my Bible that I'm holding, King James, um, New King James Version, does say the rib. Right. How it is a wrongly translation, wrong translation. Exactly. It's. I think the reason why they say rib is because they're assuming, because later Adam says, she is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. So they think that that's what it is. We find in the Hebrew language, though, uh, a little bit later down in one of the verses here where he says he taken from man and he brings out woman and literally in the Hebrew it does it says he he takes min ish 
which means from the fire of Yahweh that was inside of Adam, he takes and brings out Isha and makes another fire of Yahweh right there. And he's, the flesh itself is just the DNA. And it's kind of interesting when though, when it says he taken his side, a lot of the rabbinical scholars actually believed that Adam's whole side was torn down and God made her from that, which looks at redemption because for Jewish people, we see that God smites the rock out in the wilderness. On the wilderness journey, he smites this rock and Moses smites it and it brings forth its water and that water represented God's life. The, it represented eternal life to the, to the children of Israel who were dying. And it was only foreshadowing that Christ himself would also be put into a deep sleep and his side would be torn open. And that water that came from his side would represent the eternal life, the spirit of God, the Eitz Chaim flowing from his side that would restore and redeem back the children of Israel. But now the point I want to make though, we're, we're, and, I, and I'm, on the things that I'm saying, I'm jumping forward kind of fast because I really, I'm so excited to have my wife here with me uh, to speak on the Greek side of the writings of Paul, because many of you guys have asked me that question, uh, Steve. Would you, we see what you're saying here? You know, the, you know, you recognize that women are not less; they're not subordinate. You know, and yet we want to know more about this. And and I know a lot of the things about Paul and stuff. I've done the research myself, and uh, but I recognize too that if Adam and Eve were co-rulers in the Garden of Eden. Why then cannot me and my wife sit here and speak to you and to bring life to you so that you will recognize not just that, that my wife is subject to me. I mean, oh gosh, when you find out what really Paul said about that, it's going to blow you away. It will blow you away what Paul really says on this. And because what's happening is in the churches today, they are keeping sisters from having that personal relationship with God themselves. They're not getting that personal relationship with God because they're thinking, and I've heard the statement said many a time, you know, you serve God as you serve your husband. You know how many husbands are so messed up? Do you know how the Bible got mistranslated was because of men? Do you know that the Vatican has got a lot to do with a lot of the mistranslations in our Bible today in order to keep patriarchal movement going? I mean, we'll get into a lot of that here. What is really interesting is that almost every, every denomination and cult are teaching the same thing on women issues. They say that wives are to be subject to their husbands. They're unified there. So basically, let's say that you belong to Pentecostal church. And let's say Mormon church is teaching the same thing about women. But now you know that women in Mormon church are sub subject to their husbands. They're supposed to go and follow their husband's lead. But yet you know that their husbands are misled. Mormon church is really not a true church, is it? That's so right. aren't all these women deceived? Yet they're thinking they're serving God because they are subject to their husbands and they are following their lead. I mean, every single denomination and cult out there, look at Muslim world, is requiring of women to be subject. What I really believe in my heart, and this is what, what actually sparked my interest in researching, is that women have to have their own relationship with Christ. Amen. They have to find God one-on-one -on -one and not through their husbands. Their husbands might be in the wrong religion. They, yeah. they might be yes. deceiving them. And nowhere does it say in the Bible that women are saved based on how they obey their husbands. And That's nowhere exactly. is the husband commanded to put his wife under authority and this is the way he's going to be judged by or that he's responsible for her in front of God. You're going to stand in front of God as a mono, as a one person. Yes. And all he will want to know is, did you know me? Did you look for me? Do you know who I am? So women are to look for God on their own. They have to find a relationship with Jesus one-on-one. -on -one. And if they do, they can be baptized by Holy Spirit. And now they're ambassadors for Christ. Exactly. And if Jesus gives them Holy Spirit, he doesn't give it to them to make better sandwiches, but speak for him. 
Exactly. And we'll come to, I want to come to the sandwich part a little bit later when we get into that. But um, let me go back real quick, though, just so that people will understand where Adam and Eve were in the garden here. And, of course, as we, we see that God takes her from uh, the Spirit of God that was inside of him. You have to remember, we see that God breathed in the nostrils of Adam, nishmat chayim the plural of God's life, Yahweh's own life, came in a plural form. Never do we see anywhere where he breathed into the nostrils of Eve. And the reason we don't see that is because she had already received the Holy Spirit inside, the, so to speak, just as, a, a, an, a, as an analogy or a, an allegory here, she had received the Holy Spirit in the womb of her husband so to speak. You see what I'm saying? Which also brought out a beautiful revelation when I saw John, who forerun Yeshua, Yochanan, as we say in Hebrew, Yochanan, Yochanan, he forerun Yeshua, and yet the scripture says from his mother's womb he received the Holy Ghost. Why? Because as Eve was a forerunner showing a type of Christ bride, John also forerunning Moshiach to come, he had to receive the Holy Ghost from his mother's womb as well. He was a type of Eve. He was a type of the church, the bride of Jesus Christ. And the first bride that God had that came forth on the earth never had to have it breathed into her. She came with it already from the womb, so to speak. And so that's something I thought was fascinating. But anyway, so we, so we see that, and that's one reason why we don't see that he has to breathe on her. But when the fall comes in the garden, is where we get into chapter 3. And the serpent was cunning beyond and, and of all the beasts of the field that God had made. And he comes and he says to the woman, uh, uh, see, the woman said to the serpent, uh, 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 I'm sorry, the, the serpent first says, did perhaps God say you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, of the fruit of the tree of the garden we may eat, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the center of the garden, God has said you shall not neither eat nor touch it lest you die. So many people, rabbis included, say that God never spoke to her because she said that. Now, when we find Eve and God comes down to see what happens in the fall and he begins to get on to them all. He, first, he curses the serpent. He, you know, he goes to Adam. Adam, he wants to get past the buck. He says, the woman you gave me, she did it. You know, she's really the only one that stands up and speaks something true. God never said she lied by saying what she said to the serpent. He didn't correct her on any of that. Well, I would like to say, you know, I'm holding here in my, my hand a New King James Version uh, with a commentary. And when we are in a Genesis right here, I have it um, highlighted, is a commentary that says... The woman distorted God's command by adding her own interpretation, nor shall you touch it lest you die. Well, it kind of is really interesting that they would say such a thing because adding to God's word is a serious offense. Yes. So is the lying. However, when God came down and he was judging them each one separately, he has never judged her for adding to his word, nor lying. Amen. That's right. He only, he only judged her because she partook of the fruit. But he never said, and you add it to my word, which would be a serious offense. God would not just overlook it. So what these commentators are saying here, they're basically adding their own judgment about Mother Eve. They are making her guilty uh, with a sin she has never committed, you see. And I truly believe that God in Garden of Eden, when he came down in a cool of the day, he had conversations not only with Adam, but with Eve. Absolutely. He also had one-on-one -on -one relationship with her, yes. just as he has one-on-one -on -one relationship today with women. Exactly. He had the same relationship with Eve in Garden of Eden. Could he tell her about the tree? Absolutely. But let's see what Eve said about it. She says here in a chapter 3 of Genesis, she said, And the woman said to the serpent, 
We may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said. She says, God has said. And that's exactly She didn't that. say Adam said. She says, God said, and I believe her. Yes. I believe that she heard the command from God because God did not have a feeling that he can't talk to her. Why would he create her and then never talk to her? Well, let's, let me point out something here on that particular issue right there, what you just said here. If we fast forward a little bit and we go down to um, verse 13, and Hashem God, and by the way, I am using the Torah, uh, the stone edition, so it is a little different than what you guys are reading, King James, New King James, or whatever other translation you may be using. And keep in mind, I get so many questions asked. There are, People ask me, Steve, what's the most accurate translation you can find? That's tough. Yeah, it is. You know, if you don't have the inspired language or know that inspired language, it's very tough. Now, I, you know, I will say this, and this is something me and my wife have talked a little bit about too, you know, because of all this mistranslation, where are people going to find themselves in the end when we're being taught false doctrines so much. But yet, we have to keep in mind, the scripture does say, wake ye from among the dead. Yes, and scripture also says, let no man teach you, but let the Holy Spirit teach you. And Amen. I believe that if you truly look for the truth, if you are on your knees looking for that truth, God shall reveal to you the truth. Yes. So we go back and we read here, and Hashem God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Now, plainly and simply, she shows that the serpent twisted it up. It's not that he fully lied, but he did lie partially. Now, then God says to the serpent, because you have done this, um, change the page here, accursed are you beyond all the cattle and beyond all the beasts of the field, and upon your belly shall you go, and thus shall you eat all the days of your life, and I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring, or between your seed and her and, and thy seed. I think literally, I, I, literally in the Hebrew, it's seed. It doesn't say offspring. It does say seed. He will pound your head, and you will bite his heel, or you will bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, you see, he deals with the serpent right for what he did. I will greatly increase your suffering and your childbearing. In pain you shall bear children. And a lot of times people don't realize it's not physical pain. Exactly. It's a prophecy. Exactly. Now keep that in mind. And that's why I want to build this right here. Because these next few words is what's going to show each one of you, each sister out there, each brother that's listening out there. God is prophesying to Eve what's going to happen. Let's see what he says. In pain you shall bear children, your, yet your craving shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. The word craving here, let me read this to you real quick in the Hebrew. All right, he says to her, Teladai benim. He literally says you're going to birth sons. He's prophesying to her. And he says that it's going to cause her pain. Why? God's prophesying. He doesn't just come right out and say one of your sons is going to kill the other. One brother is going to kill the other, but God knows it's going to cause her pain. So he says to that, and he tells her, no, we typically in Hebrew, we will translate it when it says Benin, we'll still translate it children. But in this particular case, God was prophesying. Then he says, Ve'el ishach tashukotecha. See, and, and you will, the, the word tashukotecha, if you go back to the Septuagint, and my wife knows this from her own research, in the Septuagint, the rabbis actually translated as to, you would turn to your husband, which would be right, and it does. It has two letters of the root for the word shuv, which is to turn, and the tav in front of that is, is speaking of her. It's tashukatecha. You will turn to him, to your husband, and he will rule over you. Why, are you, why is she turning to him? Because she... They both, in this case, lose something, and it's in the prophetic words that God says to Eve. They're losing the Holy Spirit. They lost one-on-one -on -one relationship with God. Yes. So she's left there without the Holy Spirit. She then has no she place has to the man, to. and she's turning to him, which before God was her provider. Yes. He has provided for every need she ever had. Not exactly. Adam. Adam was her partner. 
They loved one another, honored one another. They were co-rulers, co-partners. However, it was God who provided. But now that she lost God, she, who she's turning to? She's turning to Adam, but now he has no Holy Spirit. So God is basically not giving a divine ordinance as, as a lot of patriarchal uh, churches are teaching. Exactly. They're saying Genesis 3.16 is somehow a divine ordinance of God. No, it's, God is stating a consequence. What will happen now? Because you have lost me. He has no Holy Spirit. He's just like an animal. He's just the flesh. And what will happen? You will turn to him to make you happy, to provide for you, to, to, to be your companion. However, he's going to rule over you. Now he will rule over you because he's going to abuse the power because he's stronger than you. And, and that's all that, that is simply all it is. He's bigger than she is. And without the Spirit of God, and this, brothers that are listening to this, I really encourage you sincerely to pray about this. I know that you're, there's so much that we have in our heads about the writings of Paul, and, and I can cite to you a million other issues as far as like, uh, the, you know, that will say that, well, when God chose the Levites, it was just the men. But even in that right there, do you not realize that when God brought the children of Israel up on the mountain in Exodus, Shemot, as we say in Hebrew, Shemot, in Exodus, I believe it was either 19 or chapter 21, and he gathers them all up there, men, women, and children. He says to them, he, he tells them, you will be Kohanim, priest. He, he, even the rabbis have enough brains in the, in the Torah commentary right here that they say he's not speaking to just the Levites at this particular point. He is referring to the entire nation of Israel that you will be ministers for me. And that was including women and men. And therefore, even when we begin to look at the Word of God, like the part about they think that, only, that, that God only talked to Adam, you know, and that God doesn't have that one-on-one -on -one relationship. Like my wife pointed out as earlier as well. What about Eve? Not excuse me. Uh, what about Mary? What I mean, there are so many women in the Bible that God has personally come down. And even the fact when God says to, to Eve about, you know, uh, he, or he's speaking to the serpent, he says, her seed will bruise his head. Do you realize what he's saying right there? Do you realize that the only way redemption could be brought back, the only way that the sin question could be resolved, somewhere God had to find a sister that would believe his word and not doubt his word. Because what was the tree of knowledge of good and evil? What was it? It was Satan. And what did he plant? Doubt. He planted doubt in the human mind which corrupted the seed of God of faith. That brought forth, faith brought forth everything. That's why Jesus kept saying, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to them that believe. And so the seed of doubt was planted in that human mind which corrupted everything. And God was looking for somebody that would believe his word. And in this case, according to the prophecy, it would have to be a woman. And really and truly, when Abraham and Sarah came along, both of them laughed. You know, a lot of times everybody wants to pick on Sarah. They say, well, you know, Sarah laughed, and oh, and Sarah laughed, and Sarah laughed. Do you know why Isaac gets his name, Isaac? It doesn't, it, you know, God didn't say, say that his name was uh, Tasik. It didn't say she laughed. It said Isaac, Yixach, he laughed. So, you know, before we go picking on the women like this, we need to really see what God says in his word. And in that case there, God brought that out and put it on Abraham. But the thing was, what was God looking for? He was looking for a woman that would believe him. And he knew that there would be a woman that would believe. And it was no slant on Eve. Eve was deceived, plain and simple. And God doesn't put any more on her than that. He doesn't disagree with her. He puts a curse on the serpent because he did deceive her. Adam, on the other hand, knew what he was doing was wrong. So really and truly, this is why we find in the, even in the writings of Paul that it was the man 
that, that, that brought this whole disaster upon the human race because Adam did walk out willingly. He walked out knowing what he did, was doing was wrong. And even talk about the word curse here. Uh, a lot of times in churches we can hear phrase curse of Eve or in cults especially, women are cursed by pain in a childbearing or uh, being uh, um, ruled by men. However, we do have to, by, by really careful study of the scripture, you see that neither man nor a woman were cursed. The only serpent and the ground right. were cursed, but not the people. Right. It was not the man or a woman. God did not curse Eve. That's right. He, he stated not. consequences for her. And I think you already and mentioned it was Adam. yeah, and, and, and they really fulfilled itself. And yes, is there a pain in childbearing? It, in Hebrew word it does not mean physical pain. I think you have explained it to people before. Yes. If they need to know it again, I guess you can bring it out. But what is our pain in childbearing? When I was pregnant with my children, it was the most beautiful time and the day of their birth was the most beautiful time. However, my pain in childbearing is when they get sick, possibility that they may die, or when they have arguments or don't love one another, or what, will they be saved? Will they accept Jesus as, as their savior? This is my pain in, in childbearing, right? Absolutely. And this Absolutely. is exactly the Hebrew word that is prophesying to a woman now in a fallen state. It will not be a, a pink roses to be a mother. <laughs> You know exactly exactly and, and you know that you bring out a point and I'm gonna real, I want to real quick take a, a look at that very point right there that you just mentioned um, because when God does speak to Eve about this um, he says to her let's see real quick yeah even in the Hebrew he doesn't put it when he talks about increase, uh, when he says, I will greatly increase your suffering and your childbearing, it was to her alone. Exactly. That's, that's Even though we can take it down through time, it was really just to her. This was not uh, some curse put on women for, for being worth children. Exactly. And even if that were the case, how come we do have reports of women that have children that is for life to them, it was nothing. The pain was nothing. Or, you know, I know that there's drugs and stuff like that. We won't really well, get into let, that. Let's but. talk about it. Do men have pain? Did you ever have kidney stones? Sure. Okay. How painful are kidney stones? They say it's as bad as having a child. Exactly. So, yes, it is not this physical pain of childbirth. However, in older times, Catholic theologians and a lot of other theologians forbade doctors to give women help during childbirth because this is supposedly a curse of Eve. See how Bible can be totally misunderstood and therefore... Yes. What it brings forth is an abuse of half of Christ's body, which yes. are women. Yes, and and certainly, uh, oh gosh, and that's another thing we'll have to get into a little bit later is just what has happened to women as a result of that. Uh, it has really brought a lot, and I, I want to go into depth in another meeting on that. But let me, I'd like to just real quick though, because uh, for the sake of time, I know that you're writing a book. Uh, and I'd like for you to tell the people what the name of this book is, where this come about, what got started this, and then I want to talk to you about Paul's works on headship, what he wrote about headship. Okay, I know we won't have time to go into all that. This is extremely deep subject and complementarians, which uh, complementarians are Christians that believe that men is authority of a woman, and egalitarian Christians are Christians who believe that men and women are equal. And um, basically, complementarians, well, I, I, I really lost my thought, but yes, they are taking several isolated verses. It's about four or five isolated verses in the New Testament, uh, writings by Paul, some by Peter, and they're isolating it from the context of the entire scripture, and then they're basing their theology of headship on those few scriptures. Right. And there is no time today to go into each one of them, but we will do series on everything, so it all will be explained. However, today I, I do want to talk about the word head and headship, 
the word head ship actually is not in the Bible. As a word head ship, there is no ship to the head in, in a Bible. Right. Uh, simply Paul is just stating that uh, the head of Christ is God, head of man is, is Christ, and head of woman is a man. Now, we have to remember that Bible was written in a divine language. Divine God used divine language to, to, to give his message. It was not modern English, nor Spanish, nor Slovak, my native language, no Russian. It was Koine Greek in the New Testament, some Aramaic and mostly Hebrew in, in, in Torah. Right. And so basically, if you really want to know what Paul was saying, you have to go and search for those words. What this word had really meant to a Greek speaking audience at the time. And I do want to mention this is not a Greek spoken today in Greece. Right. It is a dead language. It's basically a dead language and there are very special scientists, language scientists who are understanding and studying this language. And one of uh, those people is uh, Dr. Hyde that you had a privilege to speak with yes. and that I am about to go and interview with as well for my book because I want to put out a DVD uh, together with my book. And the word head, when Paul writes about that, I mean, writes down that word, actually in English, the word head can mean several things. It can mean literal head, as anatomical head, right? The word head can mean head of a river. Like for example, there is a head of a river and here is the stream. But the beginning of the river is here, so we call it the head of the river. Exactly. Or instrument, let's say you have the axe. Axe has the head and the holder, but together they make the axe. Or metaphoric, metaphorically you can use head, like head of the company or head of the school. Uh, which in that case you, you kind of think it's a leader or authority over that school or, or a boss, as we say. So which one of these meanings is the word head in, in that, that Paul actually used? Well, in Greek language, you find in the Koine Greek, the word head is actually word kephale. That's the word that Paul chose. Right. Now, the word kephale, when you translate it into English, it never, ever, not one time, ever, means authority or a leader. It does not have that kind of connotation or a meaning. So, when Paul speaks to Greek audience that man is ahead of a woman, they do not think that he is the authority of a woman. So, what do they really think? Well, the word kephale is an extremely gentle word, and what it means is its simple origin. Or a source. So suddenly, like let's say the message in Ephesians 5, chapter 5, when it speaks about marriage starts at the verse 21 and, and it's all about marriage, you know, it says how who is the head of a woman and how the woman is to subject herself to her husband and how the man is to love her, his wife as his own body and even give his life for her. Right. The entire message he's starting with description of who is a source of who, how it all really began, right? So basically, source of Jesus is God. He had to create that body to, will, to live in, to come among us as a man. That is correct. Right? Now, source of man is Jesus because nothing exists without him creating it. And he created the man. But then out of the man, he took a woman. So basically, what Paul is doing, he's explaining the source, the origin of a woman. And what he's really saying, they're one, they're the same. They, they're, she's out of him, she's him, she's his body. That's why he could later on in Ephesians to speak about him loving her as his own body. Because she's from him, he is her source. Right, and, and, and let me just state this for the, for the sake of those listening to understand that from the Hebraic perspective there. Moses says that God was invisible and could not be seen. This is what he writes about him. And we can look back and say, for example, when God was first beginning the creation 
And this is where it really becomes interesting in how you can begin to understand what that means by source. Because the Christian Bible attributes everything being created by Jesus and without Him, nothing exists whatsoever. And yet the Torah states that everything exists and that was created by God, Elohim, Yahweh, Yahweh, however you want to say it, Hashem, is created by Him and nothing exists without Him. So now in the Trinitarian belief, they kind of try to figure this out. They say, well, they must have been working together to do this. But in reality, that's not so, because it says in the beginning, God created Elohim bara, which is a singular verb, bara, created. So it shows that there's only one person. That's Hebrew grammar. You can't get around it. Just because it says Elohim, it's not multiple gods. God created the heavens and the earth, period. But then he says the interesting part, and this is where we can look at the head that Paul is looking at, because Paul basically, he's looking back to Genesis himself. He understands this. Right. He knows that Eve was taken out was brought out from Adam and was created a being. He knows that it was the tree of life, the Mashiach of that time, that breathed Nishmar Chaim into that clay body called Adam. So he come out of Christ. And then where did Christ come from then? Where did that tree of life come from? That's when it says in like the second or third verse, Ve'yoman Elohim Yahi od, and God said, let there be light. God making himself tangible so he could have fellowship with us. So therefore, the invisible God became tangible as a pillar of fire in the Garden of Eden. And from there, he breathed his own life inside of Adam, which now Adam come from Christ, and then from there, God separated Eve from Adam, and so now she becomes a living being as well, and there the source is. Exactly. But it doesn't make her less. No, it does not. not. And, and basically, Paul, I mean, the Greek audience at his time would never, ever understand that word as authority or leader. Never. They would know and understand that he means the source and origin. And this is the better scholarship. This is what really Greek scholars know. Absolutely. And all these making this headship into authority is basically a men's doctrine. It's a tradition. But that's not what Paul really, really said in Ephesians 5. It's not a message about who is above who or who is authority over who because it's a message of oneness and love. And next time when we actually get into the word a subject that I believe you will be really shocked what it really means in Greek, um, that's when we're going to talk next time because there is simply no time. But I do want to say again and, and emphasize Ephesians 5 is not about who is the authority. It is a message of love and oneness with one another. And why do we even say that? Well, Paul knew Christ one-on-one. -on -one. We know what happened to Paul. Yes. His conversion. We know that he spent three years in Arabia and he got revelations from the Lord that we, we, can, even, we can ask for or envy him for. Correct? Absolutely. Right? Now, we as Christians, we have to look who is the center of our faith? It's Jesus. It's Yeshua. What did Yeshua say about authority? He said, do not exercise authority over one another as the nations do. But whoever is first must be very last and a servant of all. So why would do you really think that Paul would bring message of authority exactly. you understand but now the truth is that kefale is not authority or a leader not even one time it has no such meaning in greek okay but there is a greek word that paul did use a lot and it is the word authority as of having authority and if that's what Paul was saying, he would have to use the word arch, like in the case of archangel, which they are hierarchically organized, and there is an archangel who is over another angel. There are several archangels we know of, of, of maybe uh, archangel is Gabriel archangel, maybe. Yes. Okay. And, and so on. So 
you would have to have the Greek word arch in it, which Paul did not use. He used the word kephae, as I said. Or another word in Greek language that is the word authority is the word exousia. And Paul does use it, and he uses it in connection with marriage. And I do want to read it to you. He uses it in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and I'm going to start reading um, um, verse 3, where it says, Let a husband render to his wife the affection to her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority. That's what the word exousia is, the real word authority, meaning even in Greek. Right, right. Over her own body, but the husband does. So husband has authority over her body. But then, let's continue. It says, and likewise, the husband does not have authority, exousia, over his own body, but his wife does. So... We can see here that Paul is equalizing them as equal partners, having authority over one another equally. And basically, they are subjected to one another. They're subject to one another. And they are to be as partners, not as who is the boss. That's exactly right. Exactly. And um, as we get ready to close here, uh, you mentioned Dr. Hutt. And maybe on the next video, we'll really get into some of the things that I, that I had the privilege of speaking to him with. He is a, um, uh, a Greek scholar of the Clementine writings at the University of Nebraska. And when I got to hear him speak, uh, he was kind enough to speak with me privately. We also filmed together. We did an interview together as well. I don't think I've ever made that public as of yet, but it's a very interesting interview. And, uh, and we find out from the secular writings of the day of Jesus and Paul when they were there, that when, in other words, like if somebody were to write a book about you, uh, they wrote about these men. And they, especially with Paul, he said that Paul, the way he was written about, he was the most liberal of all the men of that era. And they were shocked that even Peter was not as liberal as Paul was, that the women that were around Paul were liberated. They spoke the word of God boldly, and they were out preaching. Now, this is secular writings from 2,000 years ago to speak about Paul, totally in a different light of what we're getting today. And, of course, he sees and knows where, just like many other Greek scholars, where the changes come through the Vatican and stuff uh, that have tried to keep the women under subjection in order to be able to rule the way they want to rule. so We do have to understand that a lot of churches, or even women, believe in patriarchy today. Yes. Uh, and I really believe that they are sincere about it because they truly believe that's the Word of God. That's how they've been taught in seminaries, in, in their Sunday um, school. That's what they hear out of the pulpit, and they sincerely want to please the Lord. So they are going along with it. Yes. However, no matter how sincere you are, no matter how sincere you are, if this is not the truth, then you're sincerely wrong. And I am interested in knowing the truth. And this message is not about women being better than men or Christian submission is still there. We are to submit, but to one another. And we'll talk about it later. You are to honor and love your husband. You are to love him so much that you're willing to give your own life for him, just like Jesus said, if you are my disciples, you love one another. And, and your husband is your brother in Christ. However, we have to understand that a marriage is truly not, that's not what Paul taught. Paul did not teach male authority and rulership or even leadership. And women have to find Christ on their own. They have to have relationship with Christ independently of their husband because that's what they were looking for on the Day of Judgment. Yes. Can let's take, as, as we get ready to close here, um, would you speak? I would like to speak. Let me just say this here. I know that what you're hearing is totally different from what you've heard before. Uh, and maybe some of you have already heard uh, messages similar to this. 
But this is a time and this is an hour where as brothers that may be watching this and maybe you're seeing this and your wife knows nothing about it. Maybe I've got many of you brothers that have emailed me and talked to me about, you know, you're, you know, wishing that your wife was a believer, vice versa, sisters wishing their husbands were believers. It could be especially in the case with sisters that because of the teachings of the church and the way that they've been bound down, that there is a fear. I spoke to uh, a very famous lady recently, uh, just a few months ago, that seemed to shy away from religion itself until I shared with her what the real truth is, and that was Nat King Cole's daughter, Timeline Cole. And even then, a spark of life come to her heart. It seemed like a spark of hope. Now, I don't know, maybe she is a Christian, but you could just tell the thought of the religious way, the religious spirit that's out there, it has caused many women not to even want to believe. And then those that are believing are thinking the only way that they're going to get to heaven is what they're doing for their husbands. You've got to have the one-on-one -on -one relationship. And many of the sisters that watch these videos do have that type of relationship. I see their emails and the comments that they make. They know it. And I think many Imagine of Imagine when you told that never ever you will grow up to the point that you are your own adult. You are either under your husband's rule or your father's rule or your elders in the congregation, but there has to be a man. Yes. Even in the case of their sons sometimes. Like in a cult that I used to be believe in and I used to be in a cult and I know we have never told uh, people that watch our messages about me, but Perhaps we will in a soon future. Um, the sons, as soon as they got baptized, they had authority over their mother. And we as women, under this patriarchal culture, we can never be adult people. We are always made like infants who can't think for themselves, who can't make decisions. And it actually humiliates women. And yes, Jesus never, never that, did that. In fact, look, and again, I talked about Deborah. Look at Huda. Look at Miriam. Look at New Testament women. Look at how Jesus treated women. Look how Jesus developed one-on-one -on -one relationship with women. And he does today. I have one-on-one -on -one relationship with him, totally independent of my husband. Yes. Right? That's exactly right. And... And one thing I'll say, the first, one, first person to bring the gospel of Jesus Christ was Mary. When he had rose from the dead and he told her, he commissioned her, go tell my disciples I have risen. Now, some people might just say, well, that's just witnessing. No, he told, he gave a command for her to go and speak. That was contrary to patriarchal society. A woman, especially if you know anything about Judaism, and especially a Chabad organization, uh, which is who I'm associated with, women don't come run up there and start telling the men something that's going on, especially as, most, as important as the, the Mashiach is here. Why would he send a woman? That would be their thought. No, he would send the rabbi to tell you that. But he didn't do that. He chose a woman. And they didn't believe her. Because she was a woman. Because she was a woman. That right. even shows because of the society that we were under. So what did God do, though? He took, and he, he says like this, when he came to them, he abraded them. He said, why didn't you believe her? You know, and basically, what you can really take from that is... All this time, he had been teaching them equality. He had been demonstrating and showing that these sisters meant just as much to him as the men did. And he didn't put one down or the other one lower and one higher. Nothing or when like we that. think of a Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was distributed, poured out on all. It was them. not poured out according to gender. And no. women filled with Holy Spirit, and they get those gifts that Jesus gives as a groom to her bride and a lot of times they receive a gift of teaching or or speaking or speaking in public and men literally shut them off they take that gift away from them and i think that this is a very serious issue
And I think many of them.